We want to welcome you all to this PGC Worldwide Lab meeting. Uh, this has been a really great series and uh, looking forward to many more coming up. Uh, today, we're going to show to go over some findings from the collaborative study on the genetics of alcoholism, the project that we call COGA. <clears throat> You'll be hearing from uh, three of our investigators, uh, Jackie Myers, Jessica Salvatore, and Dina Popova. Uh, but I'm going to give a couple of minutes introduction, since many of you are not familiar with, with COGA. Uh, the collaborative study on the genetics of alcoholism is a large family-based genetic study. We're now in year 34. The initial recruitment was people in treatment for alcohol dependence. At that time, it was DSM-3R and their families. The focus was on families with at least three first-degree relatives with alcohol dependence. And we've extended out the, <clears throat> the reach from there. Uh, to date, we've interviewed almost 18,000 subjects from over 2,200 families. The group is diverse, multi-generational, which gives us a lot of power to ask questions that are not always possible with a, a single um, cohort. Uh, we've had over 12,000 of these people genotyped. Uh, one of the things that's important in this is that we have a very detailed subject characterization with a, uh, a detailed interview instrument that we call the Saga, from which a number of other groups have, uh, have, made, have used and have made variants on. Uh, it is a large psychiatric interview, substance use disorders, some environment. Uh, it's a really rich, rich uh, instrument. We have some other instruments also, and we have a fairly unique feature in terms of having electrophysiological data. And we're going to hear something about that uh, in the first talk today. Since I won't be able to go over all of the aspects of COGA, I'm just pointing you to the uh, website, which talks about COGA, has some information for the general public about genetics of alcoholism, and has some research, uh, some uh, items focused for researchers. Uh, so I do invite you to take a look at that for more details. Very briefly, to give you an idea of the scope of COGA over the years, it was targeted at the genetics of alcohol use disorder and related phenotypes. Uh, given its time, it started in uh, 1989. Uh, we started with some linkage studies. We went through a candidate gene phase, as many of you probably did. Uh, among which we, we focus uh, on GABA A2, ADH1B, KCNJ6. And again, we'll hear a bit more about that today. Uh, we carried out GWAS of many phenotypes, not just the alcohol use disorder, um, as the importance of even larger samples ha has increased. We've contributed to many of the different groups in PGC and many other meta-analyses. Uh, we were able to study in the phenotypes risk across the lifespan because the people we are studying range from ages 70 to over 90. We have a lot of data on comorbidities, particularly in relevance to this group, uh, substance use disorders and psychiatric disorders. We have brain function data. We're able to do some gene by environment studies, and you'll hear something about that. And we're doing some molecular studies to look at the uh, mechanisms behind these GWAS with uh, looking at brains, cell lines, uh, IPSCs, uh, including electrophysiology on IPSCs. The deep phenotyping really allows us to help dissect signals that come from the broader phenotypes that are studied by PGC. PGC, obviously, by uh, combining data from many groups, is often looking at a, a fairly broadly defined phenotype. Uh, we can take some of those findings and bring it into, into the level of individual items from some of the composite diagnoses, comorbidities, environmental factors. So uh, we think this is a rich data set that has a lot to offer the field. We've already shared data with, with many of the PGC groups, but people can get access to our data in many different ways. One can apply for it through NIAAA, one of our funding sources. Uh, we can collaborate directly with COGA investigators, which has some advantages since the data set is large and complex and we know it quite well. And we have the data up on dbGaP. So again, it's a large collaborative study. It's a U10 mechanism. 
It's been funded from the beginning from the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism with contributions from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. I have the website down there. This is a picture of some of the COCA collaborators, uh, which span a wide range of expertise. This is from uh, an in-person meeting in 2019. And with that, we'll get to the first paper, uh, Jackie Myers talking about how genetic and social factors impact brain functioning throughout the life course. So Jackie, take it away. Okay. Okay, thank you, Howard, and thank you all for being here today. As promised, I'm going to be speaking about some work on genomics, traumatic experiences, and neurodevelopmental influences on alcohol use disorders and related conditions in the COCA sample. Um, I am Jackie Myers. I'm from uh, SUNY Downstate in Brooklyn, and I'd just like to acknowledge my, my funding sources here at the bottom of the slide as well. So as Dr. Edenberg started us out, you heard about the family-based design of COGA. So we have very large um, families that are enriched for alcohol use disorders and other substance use disorders, as well as community comparison families. Um, we have three uh, main phases of the study that I'm going to be emphasizing here today. One is that original family sample that you heard about, which is over 17,000 individuals. Uh, and this is the sample, or the, the entire sample that we have, these extensive multimodal phenotyping. Um, so as you heard, we have very rich clinical, behavioral, and social assessments from the semi-structured assessment on the genetics of alcoholism, as well as other questionnaires. Um, we have our uh, deep neurophysiological and neurocognitive battery that I'm going to speak about in a bit more detail in just a moment. And of course, what brings us all together today are genetic data. In addition to that original family sample, we also have what we call the prospective sample, which is um, a, a study that targeted the offspring of that original uh, families that started in 2004. Our participants came into the lab at around age 12 and were followed approximately every couple of years. Um, and so we have this nice longitudinal developmental sample of adolescents and young adults, um, uh, again, offspring from these original families. And and I'm going to be talking about some of that data here today and what we could do with it. Our most recent iteration um, that began in 2019 is what we call the lifespan sample, which is uh, a recontacting of both original participants as well as those from that adolescent um, and uh, young adult sample. So the original family members now uh, in later life over 50 and those uh, prospective study participants now over 30. Um, and uh, this is a, a recontacting where we use many of the same assessments, um, but updated them to their new life stages as well. And of course, uh, during the lifespan assessment, um, we all got hit with the COVID pandemic. Um, so I just wanted to mention um, that the COGA study also has been funded by the NIAAA um, to uh, study our COGA participants through the course of the COVID pandemic. So combining all of our pre-pandemic data, over 20 years or plus of data on alcohol use disorders, plus other data that you've heard about, um, and really using that in conjunction um, with changes in substance use and, and other outcomes throughout the COVID pandemic and trying to understand what aspects of the pandemic-related stressors or coping mechanisms might be influencing these changes in substance use. So uh, as of this month, COGA has amassed over 43,000 interviews on our diverse set of participants um, across the lifespan, um, and it's this data set that you're going to be hearing about uh, analyses on today. I'm going to be delving into some of our brain functioning data and how we look at brain functioning in conjunction with genomic and social factors across the life course. You'll be hearing from Dr. Salvatore uh, a bit more of how we delve into the nature of nurture and understand the play between the environment and genetic risk for alcohol use disorder. And you'll be hearing about some of our functional data from Dr. Popova. So as I mentioned, we have um, an extensive battery of brain function data in COGA. This is largely based on EEG 
phenotypes um, that we collect both in the resting state and during cognitive tasks. We also have neuropsychological performance data and MRI on a subset of the sample. Today, I'm going to be focusing on two particular EEG-based uh, phenotypes. One, EEG coherence, which is a measure of functional connectivity that indexes synchronization between brain regions. Uh, for those of you less familiar with this type of data, you can think of this as a measure of communication between different neural networks in the brain. I'll also be showing some data um, using one of our cognitive tasks, so looking at um, the brain's response during a go-no-go -no -go task, uh, which is used to index one's ability to inhibit response or response inhibition. And just to remind you, um, this kind of life course perspective, this data that we have um, from childhood through late life really allows us to, to use our repeated measures um, of brain function, of course, in conjunction with our measures of substance use, other psychiatric outcomes, behavioral and social outcomes and genomics um, to study uh, brain functioning throughout the life course in what's um, a diverse sample of men and women. So in addition to using our um, measures of alcohol and other substance use in individual GWAS, we've also used these EEG-based phenotypes to conduct uh, genome-wide association studies in COGA individually and have contributed these um, into meta-analyses uh, ongoing in the Enigma EEG workgroup. Um, this is from a study that we published in 2019, where we focused on a GWAS of um, EEG coherence, posterior theta EEG coherence, and saw that there was a, a region on chromosome 18 uh, that was implicated in this study that seemed to be related to the expression of the myelin basic protein, which was uh, interesting to us given um, the phenotype focus on, on neural communication in the brain. Um, we saw that the uh, top variants here were also associated with a range of alcohol-related phenotypes, as well as um, corpus callosum measures using our MRI data, both in the COGA sample and in the UK biobank. So we saw some independent replication. Um, and one of uh, what I think the most uh, uh, interesting and exciting aspects of the COGA data is we're able to really unpack these genetic associations. In this example, um, this variant on chromosome 18 with EEG coherence across adolescence and young adulthood uh, in males and females. And so we're able to see that our GWAS signal that we saw in our overall sample um, seemed to be driven um, to some extent by the females in our sample uh, over the age of 25. So one of the questions that we're interested in answering um, with this set of data is asking if genetic vulnerabilities, whether it's individual loci or polygenic risk scores more recently, influence neural development, and if this in turn has an influence on uh, risk for alcohol, other substance use disorders, and other mental health conditions. So I'm gonna take a moment to walk you through uh, one of our findings from a 2019 paper. I'm gonna be showing this type of data here in the next few slides. So I'm gonna unpack the figure that I'm showing here a bit slowly here. Um, on the bottom axis here, I'm showing you age in years. So this data uh, ranges from age 12 through 32. Um, interestingly, we're, we're able to kind of go beyond this age range in our more recent data and can get up to age 70. Um, but in this slice of the data, we're stopping at adolescence and young adulthood. Um, along this axis, I'm showing you um, a number of different EEG coherence phenotypes, and this is the alpha EEG coherence. And so each of these um, uh, rows here correspond to a different coherence pair that you're seeing in my little cartoon brain up here in the left-hand corner. Um, so we have some of our frontal connections up top. Uh, and our posterior connections along the bottom. I'm also displaying some interhemispheric as well as intrahemispheric connections. So uh, this is of course a heat map. So our, our darker red is corresponding to our most robust associations. So what I'm demonstrating here is um, the association between a polygenic risk score for alcohol dependence. And this was from um, the Walters et al. PGC alcohol dependence paper. Um, and it's association with EEG coherence uh, in the COGA sample. And what we see is that the uh, alcohol dependence PRS was um, most robustly associated with frontal, central, and parietal EEG alpha connectivity 
after age 18. And I've kind of created a little cartoon um, of this developmental effect at the bottom so you could see what rate, what you can visualize what regions of the brain are really implicated here. Um, what I've hidden from this figure is that this was uh, in males only, and I'm showing you here the contrast between the association observed in males up top and females on the bottom. And uh, what you'll notice is that um, this is almost completely null in females and seems to be a very um, sex specific effect. So uh, we saw that polygenic risk for alcohol dependence was indeed associated with trajectories of EEG alpha connectivity, particularly after age 18 in males. Um, and among these same individuals, we saw increased risk for alcohol use disorder and opioid use disorder symptoms, as well as some differences in their neurocognitive uh, performance. One of the questions we had um, is, are the same effects observed for other neuropsychiatric PRS? So of course, uh, COGA is selected for alcohol use disorder, and I just showed you the effect of a polygenic risk score for alcohol dependence. Uh, but we also took a look at other neuropsychiatric PRS from the PGC, including the schizophrenia PRS, bipolar disorder, and depression PRS. Uh, and I've just compared it with the alcohol dependence data I just showed you. And what I'm showing here is sort of a, a cartoon version of the findings that we saw for each of these associations between each of these polygenic risk scores and again alpha EEG coherence among our COGA participants. And what you'll note is that there are some regions of similarity in the associations and some that are unique to each of the polygenic risk scores. One of the things that I think was most um, striking about these findings and these comparisons was some of the differences we saw in terms of sex and development. So, for example, with the schizophrenia PRS, we saw, again, similar to alcohol dependence, that this was a male-specific finding that was most robust between age 16 and 20, interesting given the, the uh, age of onset for, for schizophrenia, particularly in males. Um, in contrast, we saw that uh, bipolar polygenic risk scores and the depression polygenic risk scores um, were... Uh, were associated with EEG coherence in both males and females a bit later in development. So I also wanted to highlight um, some of the work that we do on some of our comorbid conditions in COGA. Um, here is data from a study led by Dr. Peter Barr and myself, um, focused on suicide attempts. This was, um, again, uh, a study that focused on COGA, but was also contributing to the PGC Suicide um, Behaviors uh, Consortium. Um, and uh, what you'll note here is that a very large portion of our participants with alcohol use disorder have attempted suicide, 23% of our participants. Um, so we were interested in studying these individuals with alcohol use disorder who've attempted suicide. And uh, we found that there was one gene-based finding, RFX3, um, that was observed. Uh, and we also observed some differences in terms of EEG coherence, where we observed neural connectivity, uh, increased neural connectivity among those who've attempted suicide in the sample. And I'd like to end by talking about one of our social environmental factors. Um, we're also interested in focusing on how the social environment influences neural development in COGA. Um, and here's a study uh, that we published in 2019 focused on one of the strongest uh, social factors that we see in the psychiatric literature, and that's um, childhood sexual trauma. So this was a sexual trauma experienced prior to age 12 in the participants. And what you're observing here is the association uh, between the exposure to sexual trauma and um, their neural response um, during the go no go task, particularly during the go no aspect of that go no go task. So when individuals are trying to inhibit their response, we saw that those who were exposed to sexual trauma had a uh, less efficient um, neural response in their inhibition. And here you're looking at the trajectory. And what's interesting is these slopes are not too different from each other, um, but the uh, differences that were observed were associated with a later increased risk for alcohol use disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and depression, as well as some differences in neuropsychological performance. These findings were more significant amongst females in the samples, sample and those with higher polygenic risk for alcohol dependence as well. 
Um, so with that, I would just like to summarize some of the work um, that I presented today and discuss some of the future directions. Um, we're able to observe that genetic vulnerabilities, um, whether it's particular loci or polygenic risk scores, uh, influence trajectories of brain function, which in turn increase risk for the onset of alcohol use disorders and other neuropsychiatric traits. Uh, we see genomic and neurocognitive differences observed among individuals with alcohol use disorders and comorbid health conditions. I focus today on um, some data in suicide attempt. We also have a study led by Dr. Subi Sansby Terry focused on post-traumatic stress disorder, where we see differences in terms of the genomics and uh, neurocognitive effects and PTSD as well. And finally, uh, we see that psychosocial factors also influence neural development, um, and that's associated with the onset of alcohol and, and related internalizing disorders. And I just wanted to mention that we have a new R01 um, that's led by myself and Dr. Ananda Amstatter, um, and it's part of the PGC PTSD Substance Use Disorder Workgroup um, that's going to focus on, on how PRS derive from genomic um, structural equation modeling of PTSD, alcohol use consumption and alcohol use disorder, interact with different aspects of traumatic stress to influence neural development and downstream risk for alcohol use disorder and PTSD. Um, so with that, I will stop and see if we have a, a couple of minutes for questions or if I should pass the baton to my colleague, Dr. Salvatore. I think we do have um, a minute or two for questions. And, and if you'd like, please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A and our speakers can address them as we go along. All right, maybe we'll give everyone a minute to put their questions in the chat, in the Q&A box and uh, move on if that's okay, Jackie. Sounds great, thank you. Looks good, Jessica. Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Jackie, for your presentation. And I am Jessica Salvatore. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm an associate professor at Rutgers University in the Department of Psychology, Psychiatry at uh, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. And I'll be speaking today about the nature of nurture for alcohol use disorder, specifically talking about insights from the COGA family-based design. So the data that I'll be presenting today is really a story in two parts. The first is um, a recent paper that our group published looking at the environmental mediation of genetic risk across generations. And the second project is one that is in process looking at social genetic effects among spouses within the COGA families. So turning to our first question, the, the broad question and the big question here is how is genetic risk for alcohol use disorder transmitted in families. Now, of course, the conventional understanding is that genetic risk is passed in families from parents to children through allele sharing. But we know that allele sharing represents only one potential mode of transmission of genetic risk in families. And that's because parental genotypes in families uh, where biological parents are raising their offspring shape also the offspring environment. And in turn, those environmental exposures can influence um, offspring outcomes. And this was uh, perhaps most clearly demonstrated in, in a really powerful way through uh, the recent uh, paper by Kong et al. looking at the nature of nurture using molecular genetic tools. And so what they found here when they were partitioning um, the alleles that moms and dads pass and do not pass to their offspring is that many non-transmitted parental alleles for many traits are associated with offspring phenotypes, including things like educational attainment, cholesterol, BMI, fasting glucose, and cigarettes per day. And so our question here was really, what about alcohol? And the second part that we were wondering about was, can we specify the environments that constitute the genetic nurturing path? So in that original Kong et al. project, they were um, delineating that there was this genetic nurturing path, but the environments that were transmitting that genetic risk across generations were not being specified. And so we wanted to get a bit more granular to understand what are those environmental exposures, particularly in context of alcohol, that are transmitting that genetic risk 
from parents to offspring. And so we examine parental relationship discord as a mechanism through which genetic risk for alcohol use disorder is transmitted in families. And I wanna be sure to acknowledge um, Nate Thomas, who was leading this work and um, who is a graduate student at Virginia Commonwealth University, finishing up his dissertation at the moment. So turning to the question of why would we focus on parental relationship discord? Um, parental relationship discord is a common family adversity and exposure to parental relationship discord is associated with alcohol use disorder, as well as a number of other substance use outcomes, including age at first drink, uh, as well as broader substance involvement and misuse. And relationship discord shares genetic influences with the alcohol problems, making it a really good candidate environmental exposure to look at within families because this means that offspring who are exposed to parental relationship discord are also inheriting a genetic predisposition towards alcohol problems, an example of how genetic inheritance is also associated with environmental exposures. So Jackie and Howard have already given a, a broad overview of the COGA sample, so I will be brief here. Uh, to say that within the larger COGA sample for this particular project, we selected parents and children with relevant phenotypic and genome-wide genotypic data available, uh, using making use of both the European ancestry families within the sample, as well as the African ancestry families that are in the sample. Um, of course, these two um, ancestral population, the families from these two ancestral populations were analyzed separately to avoid um, issues with uh, ancestral confounding. Um, and I'll talk about those results and how they're different across um, populations when we get to the, the results. The analytic sample sizes for this uh, project uh, differed across phenotypes of interest and ranged uh, from about uh, mid 4,000s for European ancestry individuals and just under 2,000 for African ancestry individuals. And I should mention that in the, the published paper, we look at a number of different alcohol phenotypes. For the purposes of this presentation, I simply selected the alcohol use disorder results to, to focus us and keep us, um, keep us on time today. So turning to our measures, our offspring alcohol outcome of interest was the criterion count for DSM-5 alcohol use disorder, which for the rest of the presentation, I'll refer to as AUDSX. And then within the parent generation, we had a number of predictors. So we had the polygenic scores for alcohol problems, which are calculated with PRS, CSX, and these included three large scale um, GWAS, or these were um, calculated using three large scale uh, GWAS summary statistics with COGA removed in the case of the, the PGC alcohol dependence analyses, the UK Biobank audit P analyses, as well as the MVP alcohol use disorder um, GWAS summary statistics. The parental relationship discord measure was a composite of five retrospective child report items. These had to do with um, children's perceptions or offspring's perceptions of how much um, the parents enjoyed one another, uh, the quality of the parental relationship, arguments hitting as well as tension, uh, perceived tension in the parental relationship while growing up. We also co-varied for parental um, alcohol use disorder symptoms simply because we know that relationship discord does tend to go along with alcohol use disorder symptoms. And since we're looking at the intergenerational transmission of this genetic risk, we wanted to also rule out that it was more simply attributable to confounding with this correlated phenotype or the, the, um, the source phenotype. So I just wanted to talk briefly about the partitioning of the parental alleles into transmitted and non-transmitted um, polygenic scores. So we partitioned the uh, paternal and maternal genotypes into those that are shared with the offspring, that is the transmitted alleles, which are represented in um, yellow here, and those that were not shared with the offspring, um, the non-transmitted alleles. And this work was done by um, Fazil Aliyev. And this is what we brought forward into our analyses, which I'll get to the model um, in a couple of slides here. So just briefly uh, to give everyone a sense of, of how really severely affected um, the COGA sample is, I just wanted to show some descriptive st statistics for the key study variables in the, in the sample. And so uh, relationship discord was um, moderate within this sample. 
Um, but then when we look at offspring um, AUD symptoms, um, we see that within European ancestry families, uh, it, European ancestry individuals, there are a number of people meeting many criteria for AUD. Um, when you look at moms and dads, uh, you see that moms uh, typically have lower, meet uh, fewer criteria compared to dads, which is the typical sex difference for the phenotype. And so turning then to our model of interest here. So we're really looking at three layers of this intergenerational transmission. So we have the parental genotypes, we have the family environment that is influenced in part by those parental genotypes, and then our outcome of interest is the offspring alcohol use disorder criterion counts. And so our key test in this model is really of these bolded pathways here. Do the transmitted and non-transmitted paternal and maternal alleles contribute to parental relationship discord, which in turn uh, is that associated with the offspring alcohol use disorder symptoms. So among European ancestry uh, participants and in these European ancestry families, non-transmitted paternal and transmitted maternal alleles had indirect genetic effects on offspring AUD SX through the parental relationship discord measure, as indicated with these bold paths here. Now, in contrast, in the African ancestry families in Koga, there was no evidence that parental alleles had indirect effects on the offspring alcohol outcomes via the parental relationship discord measure. Um, and in part, that had to do with a weaker association, direct association between the parental relationship measures and the offspring alcohol measures. So we have reviewed now the environmental mediation of genetic risk across generations, and I wanted to switch gears a bit to talk about a new um, project that uh, is being undertaken, looking at social genetic effects among spouses. And this is a uh, work led by uh, Dr. Sally Kuo in the, in the group, and uh, the link to the study pre-registration is here for those who might be interested in some of the more technical details, as my overview will be um, fairly general today. Um, the goal in this project is, again, to go beyond direct genetic effects to understand how the genotypes of a social partner might also influence one's own outcomes. So in this schematic here, it's just um, drawing out, you know, what does a social or indirect genetic effect mean? If we have two people, uh, the Z is the phenotype, which is, you know, typically um, partitioned into genetic and environmental components. Um, to that influence the, the variation in the phenotype for this first person in our um, schematic here. And this person's phenotype is also, of course, an environment for the second person. So when we're thinking about uh, spousal dyads, we have, uh, if we have two spouses, the phenotype of spouse one is also an environment for spouse two, but spouse one's phenotype is in part genetically influenced. So we can sort of trace these indirect pathways from the first spouse's uh, genotype to their phenotype and eventually to uh, as an environment for the second person in that relationship. And just a couple of brief examples of social genetic effects in the alcohol uh, phenotype area. Um, marriage to a spouse with the protective A allele of, this, of the ADH1B SNP um, ending in 8.4 drank less compared to those whose spouses were not carriers. And in a polygenic application of this, a spouse's genome-wide polygenic predispositions were associated with a number of complex uh, behaviors, BMI, smoking, as well as drinking. So within COGA, um, and focusing first here on the European ancestry participants, um, we, we defined 660 opposite sex marital dyads. These are individuals in first marriage and just sort of to characterize the sample, um, they were married, uh, age of first marriage was around age 23. The outcome measure was DSM-5 AUD criterion counts during marriage, so specific to phenotypic expression while married to that partner. The, um, the focal predictor was the alcohol problems polygenic scores, the same ones actually that we used in the, in the prior project um, made of these three summary statistics, uh, GWAS summary statistics. And then we also included a series of standard covariates. So these models were fit with an actor partner interdependence model, 
which is simply a multi-level model that accounts for non-independence between observations. So we're looking at actor effects as well as partner effects. So how much is my own polygenic predisposition influence or associated with my own AUD criterion count? And as denoted in this blue line, how much is my partner's polygenic score associated with my outcome, accounting for the, the correlation between our, um, our polygenic scores, as well as the correlated error terms, um, uh, residuals between our, our phenotypes. And so what we find is that having a spouse with a higher alcohol problems PRS is associated with having a higher AUD criterion count during marriage. And this is after partitioning out the influence of one's own polygenic predisposition on AUD. So we find evidence for these social genetic effects, which are of course in magnitude much smaller than one's own direct genetic effects, but still, still present. And so just to take a step back, um, the results here speak to the broader need to consider the environmentally mediated mechanisms that transmit genetic risk for AUD, and I would also argue um, broader phenotypes in families. And so this taps into the idea that the, there's a potential role, for example, for psychological interventions to disrupt something that, that is perhaps an origin or etiology genetically driven. And then uh, related to this, this more broad uh, concept of social genetic effects, uh, I think that the results here um, speak to a need to expand the field's thinking of the pathways from genotype to phenotype, which um, also uh, important to consider here is that the environment has a genotype too. So with that, that ends my presentation and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Dr. Salvatore? Well, feel free to put them in the Q&A box as they come up, and we'll move on to Dr. Popova's presentation. Over to you, Dina. I'm a little bit confused right now. How do you see my slides? I see them in um, in the not in the presenter mode. Yeah. Now, now that's good. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so. Uh, my talk will be a little different to what Jack and Jessica were talking about. It will be less broader view, but more mechanistic understanding of the AUD. And uh, it's here we studied a very specific uh, AUD and the phenotype, which was associated with increased uh, theta event-related related oscillations during the reward processing. And this was associated linked with uh, uh, GWAS, uh, kcn j 6 GWAS. Um, so um, there are a couple of, um, I originally found few, three actually, single nucleotide polymorphisms in the kcn j 6 genes, which were associated with this in increased theta ERO due, uh, ERO during the work processing. Uh, those SNPs were uh, localized in, in the non coding. Uh, region of the KCNJ6. We additionally later found other linked uh, polymorphisms all in the three prime UTR. So what is the KCNJ6? My slides are a little slow. Oh. All right, so KCNJ6 encode uh, encodes G, uh, GIRC2, which is G-protein gated inward rectifying potassium channel. Um, since it's, uh, uh, it, this channel is uh, associated with the inhibitory uh, GPCRs, activations of uh, GPCRs lead to activation of the GIRC, removal of the potassium from inside of the cells outside and hyperpolarization of the membrane. That is why if the channel is activating uh, during uh, neuronal functioning, it will lead to reduction of action potential firing. And what is also interesting is that this uh, channel can be directly potentiated by and modulated by the alcohol. Uh, so uh, one of the, I think it will, that's weird. Everything is so slow, All right?
All right. So one of the benefits of the Koga is that uh, additionally to to collection of the uh, detailed uh, information from the patients and subjects. Uh, also, what was collected is the uh, lymphocytes from the patients, which were deposited into the uh, RUCDR, which which is depository of the, of the lymphocytes. And then um, we use this opportunity, and with help from Colgo collaborators, collaborators uh, selected eight subjects, half uh, uh, with uh, uh, polymorphisms in the KCNJ6 and half without, and those with the polymorphisms were, um, we call them affected. They also had an AUD, AUD uh, diagnosed AUD, and those which were not uh, uh, without the SNPs in the case in J6 had no AUD, so for, uh, 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 reported AUD. And what we did from this uh, subjects and their lymphocytes with help of the RUCDR, uh, we generated excitatory neurons. Uh, this was done by reprogramming of the induced pluripotent stem cells, which were generated from the lymphocytes, uh, into the excitatory uh, human neurons using NGN2 transgene. Once when the induction was performed, the cells uh, were replated into the mouse astrocytes, and, the, and they were maintained uh, until mature, which most of the time takes about 30 days. Um, when when neurons were mature, first thing to, uh, we checked was we looked at expression of the KCNJ6 in, in our cultures, comparing uh, uh, affected and unaffected individuals. So what we found is that the neurons expressing KCNJ6 were also expressing uh, lots of other markers of uh, uh, mature neurons like synaptophysin, uh, sodium channels, uh, glutamate. Uh, receptors and, and MDA receptors. And what we found right away is that uh, subjects, uh, unaffected subjects, had actually higher levels of the KCNJ6 transcript compared to the affected subjects, and that alcohol treatment actually increased the levels for both groups' levels of the KCNJ6. So in parallel to the KCNJ6 expression levels, we also looked at the differences, uh, global differences uh, in a, at the transcriptional level, levels. And what we found that already at that stage, there are differences associated with the potassium regulation in the cells and other synaptic markers associated with that. Uh, of course, uh, to make sure that we can uh, not only detect the uh, mRNA, but also uh see the expression of the GIRC2, uh, we validated the expression of this uh, channel, channel in our neurons. And what we found right away is that the origin most likely of this uh, channel is presynaptic because it overlaps with uh, uh, one of the presynaptics, presynaptic neuronal markers. Uh, and as with the RNA-seq data, what we found is that GIRC2 expression levels were uh, lower in affected uh, by AUD uh, subjects, and it was paralleled by increased number of the neurites processes uh, which neurons have. Uh, the next step was, of course, to see and look um, at the functioning of this uh, channel on the neurons. And uh, unfortunately, what we found right away is that activity of this channel is extremely small uh, in induced excited human neurons. Only about 7% of the cells responded to the activation uh, of the channel with uh, channel agonists. So th therefore, we decided to look more globally of the functioning of the channel on the functioning of the channel in the neurons. And since we knew that excitability, so this channel can regulate the excitability of the cells who look at this parameter in the neurons. And uh, what we found is that uh, parallel to the decreased excitability, uh, decreased levels of the GIRC2, these neurons were also less excitable. Um, and it was, uh, they were more uh, easier to uh, respond to the uh, current injections. Um, 
uh, and it was at the level of the individual neurons. These experiments were done with a patch clamp technique. But what was also interesting that in addition to the individual neuronal excitability, what was found is that uh, the networks of the cells uh, were also more excitable, more responsive. As you can see from the recordings uh, of the uh, cal calcium fluctuations using a GCAM6 uh, reporter, we found that even at the basal state, the neurons were more excitable, as well as if you, in the condition when the neurons were stimulated with the, uh, with the glutamate. So we can conclude here that already at the initial stages, uh, without introduction of any alco alcohol ethanol here, the, there are differences between, between these two groups of the cells. So then the next question, logical question would be, what will happen to the cells if we treat them with the alcohol? Um, we use um, uh, here a uh, 20 millimolar treatment with, uh, with alcohol, which was done for seven days. We call it chronic intermittent exposure. And what we found is that after seven days of the alcohol treatment, in general, the effect was that it increased the levels of the levels of the new expression was dramatically increased. And if we look between the group differences, we see that they are kind of opposite uh, after the treatment, meaning that affected individuals affected by the alcohol uh, addiction uh, had higher levels of the GIRC2 compared to the un unaffected uh, 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 in, uh, cells. And this was also uh, paralleled by changes, uh, actually uh, changes in the excitability of the cells. So after the alcohol treatment, we no longer see the differences in the excitability of the cells, which was kind of uh, very interesting. And since we made this link um, comparing, sorry, it's again, the problem with the slides. So since we found that alcohol affect the expression of the GIRC2 and the KCNJ6, and then it also leads to the, uh, uh, to the reduction of the differences between the investigated groups, we thought that make logical to look at what will happen to, the, to the, this neurons who just overexpress the GIRC2 uh, without any alcohol treatment. Uh, and what we found is that actually after the al alcohol treatment, as well as uh, uh, after, after overexpression of the GIRC2, we similarly see a reduction of this original phenotype. So uh, meaning that indeed GIRC2 plays a critical role in the overall AUD uh, phenotype we, we uh, originally observed. So what we kind of uh, conclude out of this study is that there are initial trans transcriptomic and morphophysiological differences uh, between investigated groups, uh, which uh, affect excitability of the cells uh, via modulating the activity of the GIRC2 uh, expression levels. And that after the alcohol treatment, alcohol treatment actually diminishes these differences probably by stimulating the uh, expression of the GIRC2, bringing back to the normal levels. Uh, even though uh, our study provides a deep mechanistic understanding of the common heritable risk traits uh, in development of unique responses to the alcohol, there are still uh, a lot of critical questions will be, which I think are important to address. And uh, among those are, for example, what is the mechanisms of this differential, differential uh, KCNG6 mRNA expression and why it is uh, so robustly regulated by the alcohol? And of course, since we only looked at the expression of the KCNG6 in excitatory cells, it would be logical to look at the other uh, cell types, uh, which is very easy to do with the induced approach, uh, where, for example, KCNG6 is naturally more... Um, uh, naturally expressed, like for example, GABAergic inhibitory neurons and dopaminergic neurons. Uh, with that said, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, and my gosh, one, last slide. We need just last slide. Um, 
<laughs> so yeah, you, it will you happen. Leave that. Why don't you just yeah. stop and share for the moment? Yeah. I'm going to share just for another moment, just have a background slide. Um, I, I thank all of the speakers. We will have time for a few questions. Before we go there, uh, I just wanted to, again, make the point that we have this really rich data set with very deep phenotyping that we think will be useful across PGC uh, to help dissect signals of, of the things we're, uh, of the various things that we've studied um, and point you again to the uh, Koga website where you can find more information. And of course, feel free to reach out to any of us or uh, any of the other people at Koga. Uh, and again, we're, we're funded by NIAAA and, and NIDA and we thank them for their support. So uh, there are two questions in the box. I will then turn it over to uh, Dr. Salvatore to answer those. Um, wonderful. So the first question that I see is, um... Uh, whether assortative mating plays a role in the um, in the models and um, how we take that into account. So um, within the social genetic effects project among spouses that um, Dr. Kuo is leading, um, the, the actor partner interdependence model has that, um, that built into it. So we are accounting for the correlations, for example, between the two spouses um, genome-wide polygenic scores for alcohol problems, as well as um, the the residuals between their um, uh, for their phenotypes or their alcohol outcomes, so um, that um, you know the non independence of observation is taken into account. And yes, there is um, a, a high degree of um, concordance between spouses for their alcohol phenotype. But there is, a, and there is also an association because genotypes are associated with phenotypes um, between their polygenic scores. And then the second question I got was um, about dealing with admixture and addressing admixture in the African ancestry sample, specifically in regards to the genetic analyses and um, the PRS. So I, I guess I'm assuming in the question here, it's in the in terms of the creation of the polygenic score. Um, and we know, of course, that the discovery samples are largely European ancestry, and then we are generating the scores in um, individuals of African ancestry. So there's are already going to be attenuation and prediction. Um, in the generation of the alcohol problems polygenic scores, um, the uh, we, we leveraged what we could in terms of uh, African ancestry discovery samples and uh, both the, the PGC, you know, removing the African ancestry COGA participants, but then also in the MVP um, GWAS for, uh, for AUD, that, that was where um, we were able to get some ancestry specific summary statistics to, to leverage for that, that creation there. Um, and then, so hopefully I answered the, the right angle on that question, but if not, happy to, to discuss further. And then I think, um, Jackie, you have a, a question there too. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so the question I believe was, um, which area showed increased activity in those with uh, suicide attempts? Um, and I'm just gonna share my screen once again. I, I pulled up the slide um, because for me, it's always better to have a visual as well as hearing about it. Um, but so we looked at, at um, theta, alpha, and beta coherences. Um, and I have our little cheat sheet of the uh, connections over here on the left-hand side. Um, but essentially what we saw that was most consistent uh, seemed to be these temporal and temporal parietal, um, left temporal parietal uh, regions that were consistent across each of these um, coherence, uh, or, or each of these frequencies. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Um, still time for a couple of questions. Uh, and again, I want to thank all of the presenters. I think you you saw some of the breadth of what we're doing right now. And again, uh, there's a lot of other stuff and links to a, a large number of papers we published on the website. Uh, Arpana, did you want to say anything on this? or No, just thank you to um, all of you for agreeing to do a worldwide lab for us. Can I have a last question to, to Jackie? Yeah, of course. Uh, so actually, why uh, did you look at the alpha rhythms and what was the reason for that? And then do you plan on looking at other rhythms as well? 
Um, so for, for which study for, um, the, uh, for the coherence study. Okay. Yeah. So, um, typically we look across uh, multiple different frequencies. Um, I focus on alpha across the PRS studies that I showcased today on alcohol and the other neuropsychiatric PRS. Um, because when we looked across all the frequencies, um, that's where we saw the most robust findings consistently. Mm -hmm. So when I wanted to compare alcohol dependence PRS with um, schizophrenia, bipolar, and depression. Uh, it made sense to focus on alpha because that was sort of the, the common effect that we saw across the neuropsychiatric PRS. Um, depending on the phenotype, the study, um, and the focus, we absolutely focus on, on other frequencies. And I think, um, you know, our method is typically to go broad and, and see where we see the greatest signal and then explore that further. Thank you. Hey, Jackie, given we have another minute, may I ask you a question? Sure. Um, you know, we've historically in COGA focused on EEG, and I was wondering if you, the insights you were gaining in terms of how that EEG, those EEG findings align with like brain MRI data, because we have a small component in COGA that does that, and um, whether you could share some of that insight. Yeah, I wish I, I have... Um... Uh, a better answer for you, but I will say that we're just sort of at the beginning of understanding how how these things relate to each other. We do have in COCA, and there are you know a handful of other studies in the field um, that have both EEG and MRI on the same individuals to actually compare. Um, one of the unique things that we have in our our subsample is the exact same paradigms that we look at in EEG and MRI. Um, so hopefully, um, in a couple of years, I can answer that question for you. <laughs> right now, I think we're at the beginning of understanding how they relate to each other. Another area um, that we're exploring that question, especially from a genomics point of view, is in Enigma. Um, so there are Enigma meta-analyses ongoing, of course, of many MRI phenotypes. And we also have our um, you know, budding, but also a few publications out there group on EEG uh, in Enigma. And so there's a lot of interest um, comparing and contrasting from a genetics point of view, um, you know, what we're finding across EEG and MRI there too. So stay tuned for a, a more satisfying answer to your question. Thanks. All right. I think we are at the hour. Um, unless there are any final questions, let me just quickly look in the, I see something popped up there. Oh, great. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining, um, to our presenters for sharing their findings with us and to all of you who were able to make some time right after the start of the new year to join us. Uh, stay tuned for more Worldwide Labs. These are a great way for, uh, PGC investigators and our collaborators, colleagues to, to showcase their work. So we hope you'll continue to join these meetings as they appear on your schedule. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Thank, thank you. you. I'll see you all soon. Bye.